Good morning, Amsterdam. Thank you. Wow, we, we lost some people, didn't we? Huh. How'd that happen? So they say that behind every great man is somebody else. And thanks to Tiago, I get to be that somebody else. <laughs> I want to thank you for being so welcoming. Um, and I, you know, getting right off, I want to thank our organizers, our sponsors, and I'm not sure, but at least yesterday, this might have been some of the best conference Wi-Fi I've ever seen. How many of you have, uh, is this your first DevOps days? That's beautiful. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our community. Um, now, you should know that DevOps Days is a conference of professionals, but it's supposed to be entertaining as well as informative. Um, now, audiences will vary in their social norms. Um, for instance, I gave the same talk in uh, New York City and then like three weeks later in Toronto. New York, there was a lot of laughter and uh, some fantastic heckling, but in Toronto, there was nothing. <laughs> Crickets. And I thought I bombed. Uh, there were a couple polite chuckles here and there because Toronto. Um, but I thought I bombed, and I get off the stage and like, you killed! I'm like, what room were you in? Uh, no, no, that's, that's Canadian rolling in the floor. Um, <laughs> so it, this is a long way of saying that if you find something funny, uh, it's entirely welcome for you to laugh. Uh, if you want to throw things at me, please wait until afterwards, because that's really distracting. Um, okay. So there's a, a Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. I wish I had a better attribute than Chinese proverb, but. Um, so in my previous talk and article, Fear and Loathing in Systems Administration, um, I, discover, I discuss how to identify products within an organization. Now, some of them are obvious, like the thing that makes you money, but your LDAP, and your storage are products too. And these bear calling out. I also described that DevOps doesn't work. Because DevOps is a concept, it's a philosophy, and a professional movement based on trust and collaboration among teams and aligning them to business goals and needs. A concept doesn't do work, and a philosophy doesn't meet goals. People do. So remember, just like Soil and Green, DevOps is made up of people. <laughs> I also introduced the world to the DevOps drinking game. Contributions welcome. Um, and I, uh, I prefer questions at the end because I'm gonna go fast. But if at any time you're feeling overwhelmed, please say the safe word clearly <laughs> and we'll take a break. Oh, crap. So, uh, in America, this kills because that looks like line noise, but I realize that this, that might actually mean something to somebody here. <laughs> My bad. Let's get on with the show. So what I need to know is who you are. Um, how many, say, systems or network operations or DevOps uh, people in here. How many people are filling that kind of role? Show of hands. Okay, about half the room. Um, how about software engineering, development, writing the code for the apps? Uh, another half. We might get three halves out of this. Uh, how about like uh, also tech, but uh, often try to tack on their names to DevOps? Uh, security, um, DBA, QA. Very, uh, so like five, wow. Next time, guys. Um, how about management or product? Uh, people, uh, you know, I like to say people who may have been useful at one point, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kid, uh, th that's hard, that is really hard. How about other business, like uh, financial, legal, HR, one, somebody give him a hug, uh, offer him a hug. <laughs> Let's do better with that next year. Let's 
get some more of our DevOps people who aren't dev or ops. Um, is there anything I missed? Does anybody have a role that I didn't call out? Okay. So uh, you and I used to be useful. <laughs> oh yeah, heckling is totally allowed, but you have to be funny. So, hi, I'm Waldo. Hi, Waldo. <laughs> this talk isn't endorsed by anyone. Uh, the, I'm giving my company plenty of room to bow out and say, uh-uh, that's, that's not us. Um, this is me. I'm just a boy standing in front of his community, <laughs> asking it to try to make things a little bit better. Now, there are plenty of articles that talk about doing DevOps and aligning authority with responsibility, but what does that look like in practice? Um, I'm gonna talk about what I consider to be the definitive implementation, uh, organization-wise, of how to do DevOps. Now, you'll hear often that uh, startups do DevOps out of necessity, but generally they're not large enough to have to consider the problem. But when you scale up and you split your engineers, you might as well do it right. What we commonly have now is an org chart designed in the 1850s railroads, uh, which aligns to job titles. But from this, you can't infer the business goals or what the business even does. And this results in confusion, pain, blame, and burnout. As an added bonus, if your funding model uh, for development is the, the studio model, where engineers work on capital P projects, um, and then hand them over to another team for maintenance. Um, congratulations, you, know, you found a really efficient way of turning out legacy code. Congratulations. But let's face it, your, your CE doesn't uh, and shouldn't care that you wrote code real good. Um, they care about that the features and the products work well and that they're available so that they can bring in the money. The studio model is patterned after game and movie studios. Now this can work well if you're releasing a product that doesn't have an operational, uh, operational component. Um, studios make a lot of sense if you're releasing a film. Um, some applications like single player games or mobile apps that don't, have a, uh, don't rely on a service, these are great examples of that. It works well for them. The problem comes in when you try to apply the studio model to something that's run as a service. If you treat your development as a project, but the application is a service that has to be maintained, you're handing it off to people who aren't as familiar with it, and they're not as qualified to make decisions about it. Well, who's doing the software maintenance? Uh, if the funding wasn't cut, it's gonna be an implied, if not outright stated maintenance team who cleans up the mess. If there's no funding, you're uh, dumping it on ops to deal with. Now the idea behind a product team is that it is a long-lived, sustainable, and self-contained organization that is solely responsible for the products that it builds and runs. The products have well-defined responsibilities and borders, interfaces, and describe a contract for how to interact with their products. Before I talk about anything else, I have to make one thing perfectly clear. In this model, uh, if you have a role in functional leadership, like an engineering manager or an operations director, um, your role probably will change. In product teams, uh, uh, brief word on terminology. I'm, yeah, that, that is an irritating slide, sorry. Um, I know Scrum and Capital A Agile have terms product owner and product manager, and I think they're backwards and useless, and I don't have any of the certification, so I don't care. Um, so I'm gonna say product owner owns the product. They, they own and run a team. So for any of you uh, scrum people, sorry. Um. <laughs> Before I talk about anything else, um, oh, sorry. So in, in product teams, like I said, uh, the product owner decides the work that gets done and the priorities. Um, yeah, so I apologize for my unenlightened view here. So what do managers and directors do? I'm glad you asked. How many here are engineering or ops managers, like functional management? 
Again, show of hands. Cool. So presumably, you were promoted because you were good at what you did, right? Or at least you failed upwards, like one way or the other, but <laughs> chances are you did a good job and they thought you should go do something completely different. And did tell you that. Um, but how many of you miss the engineering that you did, but now you spend all your time doing stuff? <laughs> I'm really not that down on management. <laughs> Uh, but if product is what you, gets you excited, then becoming a product owner or product manager might be for you. Um, now, this role is a lot of things, but your central focus is the product. So in this model, the role changes. Um, your engineering and your operations leadership isn't responsible. They don't own the products anymore. They don't do product direction or, you know, ensure alignment with business goals, uh, the product leaders do. They assign work and the priority. They hire and fire from their team, and they decide the team standards. Um, functional leadership's role changes. Um, in previous iterations, I used the word tribe, but I always hated it, and, but didn't have something better. Um, Datadog, we, we use the term, sorry, Datadog uses the term guild, so I hear, um, which I like a lot better. You have a community of people with a similar role that shares information, that, that is your guild, but it doesn't enforce standards across different products. Um, now, but there's nothing saying that your, uh, your product owner is gonna be an expert in all the things that his team needs. So those functional leaders serve as fantastic bullshit detectors, help with hiring, firing of of people into the organization or do people growth. So these things that I'm responsible for, they go to a product team. You're inevitably gonna hear, what about a matrix org? Uh, no, just no, it, shut that down quickly because this means that everybody on the team has twice as many bosses and the role, like the engineers do not need to deal with this. The, they shouldn't be fighting priorities and who's a, you know being active pawns in somebody else's political game. Uh, they're going to be used to for jockeying of power and control. Um, these things are actively going to make people less happy and productive. All it takes is is really one person of enough uh, seniority in the company to really throw a wrench in the whole thing um, by reassigning people or reassigning work. So within the team, you, uh, you need to have the skills and to create it and run it. And you delegate functions that you don't possess to other product teams, you rely on them. And this is you know, well observed in, in the microservices or any SOA model. Um, database teams or DB as a service is already pretty common. Um, now, this isn't a, a case of everybody can do everything. Um, even on silo teams, this doesn't work because if you're big enough to have a silo team, you have more than enough work that, than anybody can keep in their head. So instead of everybody can do everything, everybody can figure everything out. The people on the team are on this team. Having an engineer be on multiple teams is, you know, oh, well, you spend 40% of your time here and 60% of your time over here. That does not work. It's just painful, it causes problems. How big is my team? Well, that depends. Uh, but more importantly, what are the roles you need? Now, working in close quarters, you're gonna have massive opportunities for cross-pollination of skills and abilities. You might not have a dedicated ops engineer, um, but somebody's gonna gravitate towards that, and that knowledge is gonna spread. Your ops engineer might see a bug and file a PR. Your dev might write up, write up their test suite. Um, as a personal rant, I hate, I prefer to call people engineer. Whether their specialty is in operations or systems or uh, development, because you're using techni you know, technical knowledge to solve problems. There's really no need to like squeeze people into a pigeonhole. So it's important that your team works together. Um, 
Now, having the team work together is a, often used in a, it's misvalued principle. Um, now, it is an op opportunity to make the hell that is the uh, modern open office into a useful feature. So instead of being surrounded by people who have the same, um, might have the same function as you, but are solving different problems, or altogether different problems, um, you work with this on the same problems with people of different skills. Um, this is a, a product team at, uh, unfortunately, the now defunct Zorro. Um, this is originally from Glassdoor, but yeah, uh, pour one out, I guess. The, but the most important thing is that the team works together. Now, whether they're physically together is less important that they communicate in the same ways and they live with each other, and even in Slack. My team does this, and there are no two people in the same place except the Paris office. And it's just two. Um, but you use your group channel uh, for all the day-to-day -day work, uh, lunch plans, you know, your normal memes and, B memes and BS. Um, be together wherever you can. So hiring and firing is always going to be a tricky subject, uh, but it's the most important one to get right. The product team, this is very important, the product team chooses its members. That team knows the culture that they want and the skills that they need, and they, they're the people who have to live with the person they're gonna bring in. Um, now, this is a place where smart product owners are gonna heavily leverage those functional leaders uh, in areas that they don't have qualifications in. Product manager uh, relies on the functional leadership for guidance and assistance. Um, you know, if the person isn't working out, especially technically, can the functional leader help with training and guidance and, you know, let's get that person better. So you may recall when I said that functional leadership now has more of a community be part of their real job. Um, and that's where this comes into play. They might know somebody, if they're not working out on one team, they might be a better fit somewhere else within the company. So they can broker a trade. It's a sad reality, but if the person isn't working out on the team, they get cut from the team. Um, but if there's not a place for them on another team, well, they might need to be let go from the company. What doesn't happen is that an engineer is traded out from, un uh, out from under the product team. Because this sucks. Uh, having one of your people removed or swapped or even parted out to other teams, that's awful. Uh, I had one engineer who Without me being told, the functional director had parted him out to six other teams. So I had less than a day a week, theoretically, to get him. I mean, that sucks. So if a trade is in the works, it needs to be, dis be discussed and agreed on beforehand. Just no surprises. But since you have dev and ops and QA and all of that uh, happening within the functions of the team, and these people stick it out in the long haul, this becomes a model for sustainable products. You know, the functional leaders might ask, when are they gonna be done? I love this gift, by the way. Um, the simple fact is they won't be done. As, as long as the app is in use, look for the seam, I dare you. As long as the app is in use, it has engineers behind it. Um, how many pieces of software have you ever seen that are done? As long as people are using it, it's gonna need updating. Um, now, how you approach development and, uh, and its operation will influence how respect workloads look between development ops and, and the iterative work. Eventually, feature and operational engineering will both stabilize, and as that happens, the team can take in new product work in the form of new products that they will build and support but you have to have a clear understanding of how much effort is actually needed. As a functional leader, you might say, I don't want my engineers doing operations. I'll say that your engineer's ability to write an operable app is hampered and other people have to suffer. Namely, whoever is doing operations and the customers, that's who suffers. They're not your engineers your functional manager, they belong to the product team. When the product team has capacity, then it can build new products. 
when it can be done sustainably on their terms. And if you need more work done, you need to hire new people. You need to hire more product teams. It's really important to call out decision-making authority. Um, you define your team by the products that you provide and they're implemented by, and that, that they are implemented by the interfaces that you publish. Now, like any API, which should be version, by the way, you will or should provide the inputs and outputs for your endpoints. Like any a API, the implementation doesn't matter as long as the contract is, hold, uh, is held to. This allows the team to make decisions for themselves without accommodating standards that were written for, by different people for a different use case. You wanna use an SOA or a monolith or microservices, Perl or Java or Ruby or Node or Go or whatever the latest hipster language is. Um, it doesn't matter because the product team decides because they're the ones who have to live with it. Now, odds are that your org chart uh, and the standards are an artifact of a different time and a different problem. Does that standard make things easier for you? Or does it make it harder for you to actually do your job? So all of this allows for deep familiarization and ownership by the team members, um, compared to the almost guaranteed under provision ops team who is responsible for everything and didn't create any of it. When I say that that person who knows everything about the system, um, you know, every behavior, every war, every, uh, every corpse in the closet, uh, skeleton, not corpse. <laughs> uh, you probably have somebody in mind. Um, if you read the Phoenix Project, this is very obviously Brent. Um, but it's a really problematic uh, scenario for, for many reasons, um, as is very easy to see. This is a person who is at the intersection of handoffs. And this person isn't good at sharing knowledge. They're constantly firefighting and they might even enjoy it. Um, when they do share, they assume so much of the other person that the info that they, they're actually given is nearly useless. And as a result, little knowledge is actually spread. It's a, well, what I uh, heard called a high five handoff. Now, when you don't have handoffs, when everybody has specialties, but their hand is in everything, everybody's familiar enough. Uh, they're not afraid of breaking something else. They'll dig in and try. And as with everything, the hardest thing to do is begin. If you wanna get an executive excited for, uh, for this, mention the term cross-functional team. I'm not sure why, but this makes them all gooey. Uh, fortunately, we've already talked about what goes into identifying products, um, but you should absolutely work with your ops people on this. So standing up a team to start something new or take on a critical but orphaned product, um, that's, that's a really good place to begin. Um, who owns the CI or the wiki or uh, the Jenkins servers if you're you know, not clouding everything? I, in particular, can talk to uh, insight tooling and config management. Uh, well, I won't stop talking. Um, do you have new features to write? Fantastic. Um, start with what the consumer experience is like. Um, what's the problem that you need to solve? What are your inputs and outputs uh, that you would want? And again, the team decides on what their standards are. What are the best tools to get you where you want to be? What's your release cycle? Your CI and testing and continuous delivery, oh my, so many decisions to make. But if somebody else had made them for you, you almost assuredly not, uh, I've heard engineers have opinions and everybody else's opinion is very seldom right. Um, so again, if somebody proposes a matrix org, you need to be extremely careful. Um, it's, it's very important that you keep, uh, as we say in the States, uh, separation of church and the state. All work comes from the product management. Functional management helps people with their individual careers and sharing knowledge. Now this shouldn't be hard to remember as the functional leaders shouldn't have work to do, um, but it's gonna be hard because their, their role is fundamentally changing. They're used to defining teams and defining priorities. 
they're used to uh, assigning work. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are skeptical uh, about how a product team actually works, and you might just not believe me. But if you properly staff a team, give them direction, authority, and responsibility, they'll amaze you. In my uh, humble opinion, this, this orients people towards DevOps and oftentimes toward a cloud native attitude, even when those aren't what you're actively pursuing. These are the reasons that I consider this a definitive impl implementation of DevOps. Here's the thing. It's not the only way, <laughs> but I think product teams are the simplest way to ensure that your, your products are maintained and sustainable. Now, this isn't to say that other implementations can't work, but that they can make things harder by misaligning reporting structures from responsibilities and obscuring organizational priority and investment. So let's go plant some trees. With that, thank you. If you want to talk later, if you want to talk later, I'll be out where the beverages are. Uh, if you want to talk with me much later, um, I'm G. Waldo in most places. Uh, if you want to do games, um, I'm thoroughly unimpressive, but G. Waldo in most places. Um, here's a chart. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Waldo? Over there. Uh, budget. Yes. Who owns budget? The business defines its priorities and how things are funded. The product owners give, uh, tell them how many people they need. The Business is gonna ask, well, what can you do with half? You're gonna say fail. When can you start? I think I just did. If you don't have enough people, I, that's blatantly stolen from Dilbert. Um, if, you, if you don't have the people to build and run what you have, you can't do more. Something has to give, something has to go. So either you get more people or you have less work to do, which means you have to actively retire a product. I, I mean, like I said, the operational role of most things is gonna go down over time as, as you get better at it, you automate, it more, automate more of the stuff out of the way. So your, your operational load will decrease and then you can take on more work. But at some point you're probably gonna have, you're either going to have to stop taking on work because eventually your stuff will all be stable and you know, the team goes through a natural transition, um, but that generally takes a long time. Um, you're gonna be spending a lot of time keeping your stuff up to date you're, because you have people on the team who own this product. Every time there's a bug fix, uh, you know, a security vulnerability, heart bleed happens, um, you know, Java, which, you know, Java needs updating or whatever, you're not passing this off to another team to say, uh, who, who can't say, well, it doesn't compile anymore, and who knows, or Ruby gems updated, or whatever. So the business, the business overall controls budgets as far as staffing budgets. I'm sorry, that's what you mean, right? Uh, it's more also, also more also project budget. So, well, you're not doing projects anymore. Not product as a f yeah. Product. You're not doing projects anymore as a funding model. You can do projects as an initiative, as a you know a rallying point to. Uh, for an area of focus, like you know, let's uh, let's do a project on testing. We haven't we haven't uh, we haven't done a bug squashing session in a while, um, things like that. But as far as staffing the team, uh, the company will will show how much it cares by how much it's going to invest in that team. Okay. Does that answer your question? Not really, but I will talk to you afterwards. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, maybe I can wave my hand some more uh, for that answer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Waldo. Thank you. Oh, the gift. <laughs>